Okay, and welcome to 3.2. Uh, we're going to start with chapters 5 and 6. I guess they're short enough chapters that they were able to just jam them together. Uh, like I was saying at the end of the last video, what you should do is take a page or three and uh, set them aside and just use them to write out the plot. Uh, just, just keep track of the plot. Um, maybe... Here's a good idea. Divide the page in half, and on the left side, write the plot, and on the right side, write the themes. Because there's going to be questions on the test. You don't have to write an essay about this one. This one's going to be a test. But uh, there's a lot of questions about uh, the plot and a lot of questions about the theme. Um, you're going to have to write them down. So um, I'd say do that. Divide the page in half. And on the left side, write the plot. On the right side, write the theme. Okay. Glossary, figurative language, um, thing, language that has a literal meaning and a secondary meaning, like a representative, a metaphorical kind of meaning. Apparition is a ghost. Grovel, um, okay, the best way to use this is just, if you see the word and it, you don't know what it is, come back up and look at it. I feel like I'm going to bore you to death if I just read that whole thing. Okay. Plot summary. Although Pip fears the soldiers, remember that their Christmas dinner, soldiers came in and he's like, oh, I'm, uh, one of the soldiers is like, I'm going to arrest you, ha ha ha, because he's just picking on the kid in the room. Uh, but he doesn't know that Pip actually did something illegal recently. <laughs> so Pip is freaking out. Although Pip fears the soldiers are there to arrest him, they announce that they're looking for the escaped convicts. They also want Joe to help repair a broken lock on their handcuffs. Pip notices that the excitement of the missing convict has made the party livelier. Once the handcuffs are repaired, Joe and Mrs. Mr. Wops will decide to follow the soldier's hunt for fun. Pip comes along on Joe's shoulders and reveals to Joe that he secretly hopes the convicts aren't found. The group comes across the convicts fighting, and both convicts try to convince the soldiers of the other's guilt. Okay, so the two convicts that he saw are, are fighting each other, and they're both like, no, he did it, he's the one, he's the convict, not me. I'm just a free man, that's that's the convict. This doesn't work, though, and the sergeant marches both men back to the prison ship. Pip's convict sees Pip, who tries to convey his innocence in being there. When they reach the guard hut, Pip's convict confesses to stealing a pie from the blacksmith. The man then is escorted on a small boat back to the prison ship. Now look at that. He's Pip's trying to pantomime, and he's like, "I didn't know. I wasn't leaving them to you. I swear." Uh, and then the Pip, the Pip, the Pip's convict actually shows his character by confessing to stealing the pie, so that Pip won't get in trouble. Uh, he's going to get in more trouble. He's even got the threat of like hanging because of stealing, but uh, he shows true character by admitting to this thing to protect Pip. Pip is relieved that the convict takes the blame for obtaining the pie, but feels guilty about not confessing the truth to Joe. Pip tells us he was too cowardly to do what I knew to be right, as I had been too cowardly to avoid what I knew to be wrong. Meanwhile, the adults argue about how the convict could have broken into the pantry to steal food. At the end of the Christmas feast, Pip is taken to bed. Literary devices. These chapters are filled with the theme of justice, Specifically, the clash between personal beliefs and British law. First, justice is shown as entertainment for the working and middle class, right? Because it's, it's like, oh, let's go on this manhunt. Oh, can we watch? Uh, they don't care that the prisoners are also humans being hunted like dogs. They just want to watch. Uh, it's sort of like how there is a TV show where you follow the police around. Huh. Anyway. They eat and drink merrily at the exciting thought of convicts being hunted, and then join in the hunt for fun. Pip's thoughts that the convict's misery can be others' pleasure shows irony. Next, each convict believes in his moral superiority and tries to convince the soldiers of the same, but the sergeant views them in, only in terms of the law, marching both of them back to prison. Soldiers speak about the convicts as if they're animals. Pip's convict confesses falsely of stealing to protect Pip. A generous act that likely gets him in more trouble. The clicking sound Pip hears in the convict's throat can be assumed to be his attempt to hold back tears. I think they're assuming you're reading this, like the actual chapters, along with this. Which, I mean, you can if you want. 
Um, not really necessary. Pip feels guilty for not being truthful to Joe because he loves Joe, yet he chooses to protect his reputation rather than confess. Despite this, we can see that Pip has a moral compass due to his conflicted state and the fact that he recognizes his cowardice. This theme of protecting one's reputation versus exhibiting personal integrity runs throughout the novel. Um, which is a big, important theme. Like, do you confess to wrongdoing even though it's going to make you look bad? Uh, or do you do it because it's the right thing even if it harms you? Why is Pip troubled by the social fits? We already covered that. How does Dickens illustrate that Pip is struggling to keep his secret from Joe? By sharing his memories. Uh, he's filled with guilt. How does Dickens use irony to highlight Pip's secrecy and deception? I guess it's that the soldiers show up. The irony is, like, he thinks he's getting away with it, and the soldiers show up and they joke about... Yeah, they joke about arresting him when they really should be arresting him. Although, I don't know if they'd really arrest a five-year-old. Okay. Chapter 7. Pip is now a few years older, and he becomes Joe's odd boy, performing odd jobs, although the money he earns is taken from Mrs. Joe's cash box. Pip goes to school, where Biddy, an orphan who runs a shop connected to the school, helps him learn to read and write. Is Biddy a boy or a girl? I don't know. Pip writes a letter to Joe, who clearly can't read, but agrees to learn from Pip if it's kept a secret. Right, there's a there's a scene where he, he's written this thing to Joe and he hands it to him and Joe reads and there's only like two letters that he recognizes and it just keeps repeating those two letters. Then Pip is like, Joe, do you not know how to read? And he's like, I, he looks around and he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to read. And he says, well, I'm going to school. I'm learning how to read. I could teach you how to read. And he's like, yeah, as long as you don't tell anybody because it makes me look real dumb if people know I can't read. Uh, Joe tells Pip about his early life with a drunk father who beat him and needing to work to support his mother. So that's why he never went to school. He had to, he had to work early. Pumblechook announces that Miss Habisham, an eccentric, wealthy older lady, wants Pip to visit her. Okay, that's a lot, a lot happened there. So first there's a time jump. It's a few years later uh, because this story is told from Pip's perspective as he is an adult looking back on his life. So he's like, okay, the first most important thing is the time I, I helped the convict. That's stuck in my memory. All that guilt uh, is really weigh, still weighs me down to this day. Um, so let me tell you that story. Now skip ahead. And the next most important thing is, well, I was, I was Joe's odd boy. I did all these odd jobs for him. Uh, I was not necessarily his apprentice yet because I wasn't learning blacksmithing. But I was uh, running errands and stuff like that. Uh, and then I started to teach Joe how to read. And then uh, I got this invite to Miss Havisham's house. And Miss Havisham is an eccentric. If you don't know what eccentric means, it means like charmingly crazy. We usually use eccentric in, in connection with wealthy. Uh, because if you're poor and eccentric, they just call you crazy. If you're wealthy, they call you eccentric. In this chapter, the theme of social classes coupled with the ideas of pride and reputation are further explored. Pip attends an inferior school for the working class, and Joe's illiteracy and family history further reveal his lower class background. Joe insists that he can read, although it's obvious he can't. This reflects people's view of literacy as a class marker. Joe's story about his life, his reasons. Now, okay, I'm going to pause for a second because nowadays uh, it's very uncommon to not be able to read. And that's because of our universal schooling. That's because we provide schooling for everybody from uh, age 5 to age 18. Um, and not just provide it, but require it. Uh, and that's, it, it's, it's one of the ways where we can kind of erase the class differences in our society, in American society, um, and of course all the other countries that, that do mandatory education. But if you get rid of uh, these class markers, you so oh, only rich people know how to read, they, they might say. Um, but if everybody can read, there's one less thing that makes me less important than you. 
or you me. Okay. Joe's story about his life. Da 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 da. Joe's story about his life, his reasons for being with Mrs. Joe, and his desire to raise and love Pip reveal a lot about his character. Joe explains that after seeing his mother hurt, he wishes to show Mrs. Joe only kindness and be a little ill convenienced myself. And despite his memories, though, convenienced, because it's his accent, despite his memories, though, Joe refuses to hate his father. Pip can see that Joe is superior, if not in social status, in morality and kindness, and the boy cries tears of admiration. So Joe is now set up as our uh, moral compass. He's our, he's our conscience. He's, he is the voice in Pip's head that tells him what the right thing is to do at any given moment. Um, hopefully you have somebody in your life who is that, who is, when, you, when you're about to do something wrong, there's a voice in your head that speaks up and says, don't do that, I will be disappointed. Hopefully you have a person like that. Okay, chapter eight, we're chugging right along, chugging right along. Uncle Pumblechook, who is, if you remember, he got drunk, uh, and he sermonized, and he berated Pip, he's kind of a jerk. Um, Uncle Pumblechook brings, brings Pip to his house, where Pip notices that the merchants in town spend more time snooping on one another than tending to their businesses. He quizzes Pip in arithmetic while they eat. Just basic math, plus and minus. Uh, he quizzes Pip in arithmetic while they eat, then walks Pip to Miss Havisham's large, dark house. Her beautiful but snooty daughter, Estella, lets Pip in and constantly insults him. She dismisses Pumblechook and explains that the brewery on the side of the house is no longer in commission. Uh, brewery, of course, where they make beer and ale, uh, lager, all those things. Um, and it used to used to run and probably made them money, but now nobody runs it and is just sitting there abandoned. Taken aback by the house's dark corridors, Pip knocks to enter Miss Havisham's room. Uh, there he is further taken aback by Miss Havisham herself, sitting in candlelight in a yellowed wedding dress. The yellowing of the fabric represents the former glory of Miss Havisham. Telling of her broken heart, she orders Pip to occupy himself with play. Yet Pip stumbles around and is unable to do so due to the environment being new, strange, fine, and melancholy. Melancholy means, like, sad. So, they describe... There's a section where they describe the, the house of Miss Havisham as being this grand, uh, fancy, it's like a mansion, but it's a mansion that's fallen into disarray. Everything's covered in dust. Uh, everything's dark. They don't have any of the windows open. There are no candles burning. Remember, this is before electricity, so, um, it's, it's just kind of, it, it feels abandoned. It feels like a haunted house, and, uh, it's odd that there are still people living in it. Um, you may have visited a house like that before. It's got an odd feeling to it. Where you walk in and you're like, I can't believe people live here. Okay, all the clocks are stopped at 8.40, representing Miss Havisham's inability to move beyond her painful past. Pip and Estella play cards, while she continually insults him as a common laboring boy. Finally, Miss Havisham tells Pip to return in six days, and dismisses the two of them. She is humiliated by this treatment, feeling poor and common. Estella puts his food down on the ground and delights to hear him sobbing. She's Yeah, she goes to feed him and, and puts the food on the floor because he's like a dog, and he cries about it, and she thinks it's just funny. Pip wanders around the courtyard and sees a vision that terrifies him. Miss Havisham hanging by a noose. Uh, yeah, it's a vision. It doesn't really happen. He just, I guess he imagines it. Okay, literary devices. The chapter begins with a somewhat humorous portrayal of middle-class store owners and artisans. They're more interested in snooping on neighbors than working. Estella reveals the name of Miss Havisham's house as Satis, which means enough in Latin. That's where satisfied comes from. Uh, the name is meant to imply that whoever had this house could want nothing else. Estella finds irony in this characterization since the house has become so dilapidated. Pip, too, sees the name as inaccurate, 
the house being frozen in time by the pride, stubbornness, and broken heart of its current owner. Dickens uses his surroundings to provide detail about Miss Havisham's character. Saddest House is an empty, crumbling building with no life or joy, reflecting and shaping Miss Havisham's character. She and the house are decaying from the inside out. Pip attempts politeness and contradicts Estella's prickly attitude by offering his best manners. When Miss Havisham asks Pip about Estella, he calls her proud and pretty. Meanwhile, Estella focuses only on Pip's physical appearance and class and ignores his personality. She places his food on the floor as if he were an animal. Pip attributes his crying to his sensitive nature due to the injustice of Mrs. Joe's treatment of him. He doesn't seem to recognize the same injustice in Estella's treatment. Perhaps it's due to her higher class, as if her class status affords her the right to treat him poorly. Estella's name means star. She'll prove to be Pip's guiding light throughout the novel. Okay, so basically, they're suffering two different kinds of abuse, right? Um, he's being brought up by hand. He's getting beaten and stuff. Uh, while she's being treated cruelly and uh, partially neglected, uh, being asked to grow up faster than she should. Like, she's missing bits of her childhood because she's taking care of this old crazy woman. Um, so, while they should, you'd like to see them commiserate together and share in the pain and befriend each other, they are almost immediately are kind of enemies. Pip is trying to be nice because she's upper class, and he knows that as a lower class person, you have to suck up to the upper class people. Uh, but she's just treating him like straight garbage. Uh, think about the characters you've been introduced to in the novel, specifically how the treatment of Pet Pip affects him. Think about Dickens' portrayal of Pip as a child affected by these characters. Can you relate to his responses? How have his relationships affected his development? Um, well, there's a bunch of people trying to influence him, trying to, to teach him how to be, and mostly he wants to take lessons from Joe, because Joe's pretty cool. All right, what is this meaning of words? Read this excerpt about the naming of Manor House. Its other name was Satis, which is Greek, or Latin, or Hebrew, or all three, or all one to me, for enough. Enough house, said I. That's a curious name, miss. Yes, she replied, but it meant more than it said. It meant when it was given that whoever had this house could want nothing else. They must have been easily satisfied in those days, I should think. Uh, next, think of the word expectation. From ex and spectare, out to look to look out to look out to the future. If you're looking out for an anticipating something, is that the opposite of having enough, being satisfied? Yeah. How does that represent Pip's internal struggle thus far between wanting more and loving or feeling obligated to someone like Joe? Right. So it's that it's the struggle between uh, wanting to move up and do more and make more and be more. And be and as opposed to being happy with who you are right now and what you have right now, um, it's a struggle. It really is. Do I if I if I say I'm happy with what I have, does that mean I'm becoming complacent and I'm lacking ambition? Um, if I only focus on what I don't have, doesn't that just make me sad? Because I'll never, I'll it, nothing will ever be enough. There's a balance to be struck there. Write a brief description in two or four sentences of Miss Havisham's home and her appearance. Oh, doo -doo -doo -doo. oh, here's a good passage. But I saw that everything within my view, which ought to be white, had been white long ago, and had lost its luster, and was faded and yellow. I saw that the bride within the bridal dress had withered like the dress, and like the flowers, and had no brightness left but the brightness of her sunken eyes. I saw that the dress had been put upon the rounded figure of a young woman, and that the figure upon which it now hung loose had shrunk to skin and bone. Once I had been taken to see some ghastly waxwork at the fair, representing I know not what impossible personage lying in state. Once I had been taken to one of our old marsh churches to see a skeleton in the ashes of a rich dress that had been dug out of a vault under the church pavement. Now, waxwork and skeletons seemed to have dark eyes that moved and looked at me. 
Uh, one thing they haven't directly addressed is, I, I think you're supposed to just assume this, she's wearing a wedding dress because she was jilted at the altar. Uh, she went to go get married and he left her at the altar um, years and years ago and she has not let it go. I don't think we need to do the flashcards. I'm going to stop here and I'll meet you at 3.3. .3.